Amen. Got your Bibles? Matthew chapter 5, and then we're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 14. After the uh, tornado that went through South Houston and just bounced around, and of course many of us were quite aware of it, our radars are telling us now where something is. And uh, before we could even see the damage, we knew the tornado was on the ground. And so it affects our area. It kind of shakes you up some, doesn't it, Dana? Birdman, a little bit, a little shake there. And, uh, you know, it just it, it kind of racks your world because you don't know where that thing's going. It's, it's sporadic. It's unlike the hurricane that comes in. You know it's going to take over the whole city. So that thing was bouncing. Matthew chapter 5, I'll just leave you seated this morning. It says, you have heard that it had was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I'm going to tell you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. It rains on the just and the unjust. You know, just because you feel like you're God's favorite don't mean you're not going to get a little rain on you. You're not going to get a little turbulence, a little storm. I, uh, there's a joke running around because I've been, uh, I've been riding scooters since I was 12 years old. And Kenny, there's this is joke with the, with the bikers that I run with that every time I get on a motorcycle, it's going to rain. And uh, that times during a drought, I go get on my bike just to see if we can get a little rain in the area. I've been caught in the rain so many times. I can't tell you how many times I've been caught in rain, just like today. And uh, I remember one time Joseph was just learning to ride scooters, and we left in absolute sunshine. And before we got home, we were soaked. And we don't know where it came from, but it, it rained on the just and the unjust. It just does that, so you just know it's coming. And there's some things that I've learned, you know, when getting caught there. I may get caught in the rain, but I never leave in it. I'm not going to leave in it on the scooter, I just, but it'll happen. Dishpan hands are only temporary. I've learned that boots will dry turned upside down on the A.C. overnight and other garments. Riding your bike in the rain will take a little out of you, but it'll sure put a whole lot in you. Always keep your rain suit with you. Learn that one. That's a good lesson. Getting caught in the rain doesn't mean God doesn't favor you. Hard times are not necessarily a sign of us doing something wrong. Jesus told the disciples to get into a boat and go to the other side. The wind was contrary, not because they were going the wrong direction. He told them to go that way. Sometimes we get superstitious. We, we think we're spiritual. So when things uh, come up, we say, God is trying to tell us something. I, I do believe he is. He's probably saying, row harder, swim faster. Amen. Do take care of that. Problems do not necessarily mean we're going to have something that's going to happen. So there's a fine line between greatness and maintenance. And we can bump along or until hardships come, and then it determines whether you're going to get better or bitter. World War II with Winston Churchill, he said that when, when he went to the president of France, who was in a panic saying that the Nazis were going to get our country, Mr. Churchill, the, the leader of England, said, and he replied, I was born for this hour, and we will win. Churchill would have been an unknown politician if it had not been for World War II. He was not popular. As a matter of fact, after the war, he was voted out. You know, it's going to be what we endure during a time like this. It depends on how much we believe and how much that we love. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Jesus, after a hard day of ministry, he immediately made, they were trying to make him king. He just fed everybody with, with a couple of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and about 15,000 people. And so immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. Now, there had to be questions because he said, I want you all to go to the other side. I'll meet you over there. They, had to, they have to ponder, how is he going to get over there if we in the boat heading over there? It's got to it's affect you just a little bit because he said, go on over to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed him, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, 
buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. It's, it's an understanding that Jesus saw them or knew the direction they were going. Again, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. And during the fourth watch of the night, it's around 3 a.m., Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, I'm not going to go through all the, the preaching parts of this that I could. I want, I want to just emphasize something here. But again, to see a ghost on the water, an apparition on the water, meant that impending doom or death was next. And when they saw that white, and I'm going to say white tunic or whatever Jesus was wearing, walking on the water, fear hit these seasoned sailors. Amen. These were men who were used to the water. And they, the water is buffeting them. And during that fourth watch, they thought it was a ghost. Verse 37, but Jesus immediately said to them, and he's close enough for them to hear him, take courage in his eye, don't be afraid. A statement came from the boat, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. I've often laughed at this point because who else do you know that walks on water, Peter? Who else do you know that does it if it's me? What do you mean if it's me? Come, he said, and then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried, Lord, save me. It's absolute the shortest prayer in the Bible. Amen. Pastor David, sometimes there's not time for a long prayer. It's got to be a short prayer. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, y'all quit and behave. Now, I promise you if that man was sinking, it'd be a short prayer. Just like y'all, Lord, save me. Amen. And when they said that, the scripture says that Jesus reached down, grabbed him by the hand, and lifted him up and said to him, ye of little faith. He said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Knowing that when he got into the boat, that the waters died down tells me that the storm was for the disciples. It was to teach them something. He can walk on the storm. He can walk on the waves. But it was there as a teachable moment for them. They were going to learn something about the rain. They were going to learn something about the turbulence. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says here in verse 24, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. The word buffeted there, amen, carries the thought trouble. The Webster says uh, turbulence comes from the word trouble. In other words, they were in trouble. There are times that you find yourself in the rain and the storms of life. The winds are whirling around, and you are in trouble. You're finding the middle place of that house, the lowest place in that house. You're getting a, a mattress put over your head in that house. Can I get an amen? Amen. The things are, you're, in, you're getting buffeted right now. As a matter of fact, it literally means to agitate mentally or spiritually, to worry or disturb. It doesn't always have to be physical. It can be something spiritual that comes over you where you are having turbulence. There's something going on inside of you is to put you into a confused motion or to cause an inconvenience. Trouble comes in all shapes and sizes, big and small. The word turbulence, wild commotion, irregular atmospheric uh, motion, especially when characterized by up and down currents. I meet people that live in turbulence. They're up and they down. They up and they down. You can look at that uh, social media post, and it's given Jesus all the glory on Monday morning. By Thursday, the whole world hates me. Amen. They up and they down. You can't live your life up and down. Amen. You, you got to thank God for the mountaintop, but you got to learn to uh, balance out in life because them low places too long will get you in trouble. So here that, that turbulence is, and it happens in all of our life at some time in our life that it will take place. And it's not safe to keep going that way. Your life becomes accustomed to it. And people get accustomed to you being that way. And they ask you, can I be honest with you? No, no, let me turn away from you. Let me be honest with you. Folk get tired of it. They're tired of seeing you up one minute and down the next. They're ready for you to learn how to, to balance out your life. Amen, because you're driving them nuts when you're down. Not only that, you're not being a really good witness. Amen. So he, they cry out, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Only one always hits me. Twelve disciples in there, and only one cried out. He gets out of the boat. Now, they had to think he's crazy for getting out of the boat. But there's something we learn whenever we're going through turbulence, when we're being buffeted, when the rain hits. Amen. Because here's the thing. This wave walking experience for Peter changed his life forever. You know, I'm going to say this, and maybe we'll get on this thought for the next few, I don't know. 
but I got to mention it. At this moment, Satan had to think to himself, look at that man walking on the water. Let's all go down to the river. There's a man and he's walking on the water. Come along with me. It's all I want to see is that man walking on the water. Never said I was a good singer. I just like doing it. But that's one of the first songs I remember way back in the day, learning to try to play a guitar. Amen. The man from Galilee. And there he was walking on the water. But that was something. Satan said, you know, look at him walking. That's he just showing. He's just being God. Amen. But that second man walking on the water changed everything. It taught us that we can live by faith. It was faith that got Peter out. Amen. And he walked on the water, not once but twice, because after he sank, he walked back to the boat with Jesus on the water. Had to be an amazing scene there. And Jesus gets in the boat, tells him, why'd you doubt? Amen. You got, you got you, your faith. Where's your faith? And then the water calmed down. It was just a, a, that powerful teaching moment. So what, what happens when you get caught in, in the rain? What does it reveal? First, the nature of your faith. Is it strong or is it weak? Amen. Is it little or is it much? What's your faith say when you get caught in the rain? Amen. When the storms are coming, I promise you, I pro there are many believers in this room, if a tornado went around you, you're calling out to Jesus. Amen. Your faith is telling you to call out to him. That's what faith does. When turbulence hits, when you get buffeted by this world, when things go wrong economically, Jesus, I'm calling on you. I need you. It's going to show you where your faith, your faith, your faith is everything. Amen. It's your faith that Jesus prays for. He told Peter, I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. People will fail you. Don't let your faith fail. Finances fail. Don't let your faith fail. Amen. Your health will fail. Don't let your faith fail. By faith in God. That's all you need. You keep your faith in him. It's your faith that keeps you going. Amen. It presses you on. How have we been able to make it 20 years as, as two churches? It's our faith. Keep believing God for crazy stuff. And God, keep on doing it. Can I get an amen? Keep your faith. Second, the strength of your commitment. Are you going to stick or are you going to depart? You're going to stay in the boat or you're going to get out? What are you going to do? Are you going to stick to this? You know, a lot of times when, when things go wrong, when turbulence and you get buffeted, you just want to quit. We do. And I ain't saying some of us hadn't quit before, but a lot of us came back. Amen. Got back up. So it teaches us to stick. Amen. The next thing is the level of your maturity. They're, they're, they're in, biblically speaking, when you get born again, you are an infant. You are, you're just simply a child. Amen. Infant to adolescent. And what we want to do in Christ, as we've talked about being a believer, disciple, Christian, is also we want to move from the infant stage to an adolescent stage, amen, to a teen stage into a maturity. That's where God wants to lead us. And some people can do that within a couple of years. And others, it takes them 40. Thank you, Charlie, for the amen. I know. It takes a long time, and sometimes we bounce back and forth. But the rain seems to do that in our lives, spiritually speaking. Paul said to some people, he, to the Corinthians, he said, I couldn't talk to you as adults. I had to give you milk because you ain't figuring this thing out. You ain't understanding. You got to stand during persecution and all the rain and being buffeted in life. The healthiness of my attitude. How's your attitude when a storm hits? Amen. Yeah, we used to wear altimeter. It's in an airplane, I believe. Amen. It tells you where your nose is. Hallelujah. Your nose too high. You get arrogant. You, you, your nose gets too low. You stumble. Level out. Amen. Sometimes you got to put your hand right here and see where you at. Find out if your, your nose is, and then the measure of your teachability. What are you going to learn in the storm? Yesterday, we had a wedding out at the ranch. We moved it into the sanctuary, and I was talking to a family in there, brand, brand new people that come into the wedding, and I was just making conversation. And I said, right now, uh, during in 2017, the water would be over your head sitting in this building. In 2019, the water would be over your head in this building. I said, we learned something. There ain't no carpet on the floor. Amen. We learned some stuff. We walked through some things. If you don't learn in the rain and the storms, amen, the turbulence of life, you're going to keep going through it again. Amen. So you've got to learn your lessons when you hit it. So what we learned while we're getting wet is remember, everybody gets wet. Ain't nobody going to get out of this thing, man. It rains on the just and the unjust. Some get wet because they're out of the will of God. Some get wet because they're in the will of God. It's progressive pressure that causes us to grow. Sometimes God calms the sea. Other times he calms us. 
Amen. Sometimes we just stay in the storm, but he's calming us down. So Jesus does several things for us when the rain hits. First, he prays for us. Thank God. He ain't never left us. He prays for us. Amen. We pray to him. He's praying for us. Verse 23 says he's on the mountain. Why is he on the mountain? He's praying. You know what? I, I, you say, Pastor, what is he praying? I, I do not know. I don't know what he's praying. He's talking to the Father. But I have this suspicion that he's saying, Father, I sent 12 men out onto the sea, and in just a few hours, they're going to be screaming, thinking death is fixing to swallow them. Father, in just a little while, the water's going to start flowing over into that boat. And when it does, I can see the complaining taking forth. I can see Thomas starting to doubt that he should ever be with us again. Father, I want to pray for them disciples that you gave me. They're sons of the faith, and I'm asking that you'll be with them. And as I go out on this water, I'm going to give out a shout to come, and I'm going to see which one of them is man and faith enough to get out of that boat. So, Father, as I walk out on these waves right now, be with me because I'm fixing to talk to the boys. Amen. He prayed for them. He's praying for you. He's praying for us right now. He takes intercession for us, and he comes to us victorious over our greatest fears. There's no fear that you've got he's not conquered. No fear you've got. He's conquered heights, standing on the pinnacle in the Luke chapter 4 when the devil tempted him. He's conquered the fear of dying of, of, of uh, lack of nutrition, amen, by fasting for 40 days. He's conquered over everything, even death. He's already conquered it for us. Every fear you've ever imagined, he's already conquered. The fear of betrayal, when somebody you love walks out of your life, he's conquered that fear when he dealt with Judas. Amen. The, the, the other issues in his life, when his disciples walked away from him, he conquered those too. And then he went to the cross and he conquered death, hell, and the grave for us. Amen. That's what he does for us. And he ministers to us. Amen. When he says, don't be afraid to hear those words. So things to do when the discouragement comes. First off, I'm going to tell you, do something. You got to do something. When the rain hits, you got to do something. You got to prepare yourself. I went and got a rain jacket this morning. Amen. You, you, you just can't just... Act like it ain't happening because it's happening. Don't just get by by making a living. You got to make a destiny. You got to press through. Joseph rose up out of a pit to rule the land. They threw Joseph into a pit, this young boy. You've heard me preach last year on detours. We talk about Joseph and all his detours. And I'm going to tell you, they threw him into a pit, but they forgot how gifted he was. They forgot that he was gifted by God to be a leader. Listen to me. People can take your coat but they can't take your gift. People can put you in a pit, but they can't take your gift. It's your gift that promotes you. It's your gift that brings you before the famous. It's the gift that's going to give you a blessing in life and favor you. It's your gift. They can take a lot of stuff from you, but they can't take your gift. Amen. You can strip me down, put me in prison, but you can't take my gift. You can lie about me, but you can't take my gift. Amen. I got a gift to do what I do, and I'm going to keep doing what I do. Amen. So this gift promoted this man, Joseph. What would you do if you thought you could not fail? What would you do if you thought you could not fail? Wow. It changes everything because it's the fear of failure that stops us from going forward. Do something. Amen. In other words, do what you can do. Sometimes we try to hide behind our faith as an excuse to do nothing. Listen to me. You can do what you can do. Let God do what he can do. But don't you try to do what only God can do. And don't you expect God to do what you're supposed to do. Can I get an amen? I got, I got calls all week about needing this, that, and the other. And I thought, well, some of them things I can't do nothing about. God's going to have to do it. Amen. You know, I get a call, somebody's plumbing's bad. I send David. Amen. <laughs> you need somebody parking cars, I call Joseph. Hallelujah. I mean, I, I'm, we, got, we got people that can do stuff. But then there are things I can't do. I can't heal you. I can't make them love you. Amen. I, I, can't, I can't ask God to bring the cat back. He ain't doing it. Some things you just don't do. That only God can do. Amen. So it's only when you let the enemy paralyze you that you become unable to overcome your problem. God has given you all you need to overcome your trials. Amen. Listen to me, church. You're built for it. God built you for the turbulence. He built you for the rain. He built you for the trouble that you're going through, the, the opportunities to be up and down. Don't beat yourself up. Actually, don't, don't beat yourself up. 
Everybody gets wet. When my eyesight started dimming last year, I beat myself up. I mean, I've always had good eyesight, and then all of a sudden it started going down. And I've been praying over my eyes. God, I need, I need vision. I need, I need help here. I mean, I can barely tell that says 930 in the back. With no glasses on, I can't even tell who y'all are now. So I, I started, this, and it really affected me. Because then it's like, I don't even know who's in the church anymore. I know I look better like this, but this is where I'm at. So I'm, I'm learning to deal with it. I was talking to a young man yesterday named Rooster, and I said, yeah, my eyes started going bad. He said, I'm sick. I said, I was 61 for my eyes started going bad. He said, yeah, I was in the third grade. Made me feel a little better. <laughs> Amen. Hadn't been that long. But don't beat yourself up because things are happening. Amen. Some of it is age. Some of it is issues. But many of us, we're harder on ourselves than anyone else. You begin to get into the mentality that I have to make this work at all costs. And pretty soon the enemy has you over there doing things that are not right or by, but by the, telling you that the end justifies the means. God didn't create you to beat yourself up. He loves you too much. Quit beating yourself up because things ain't working out the way you thought it would. Everybody got to learn when you're wet. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Amen. Number three, have a friend a confidant that you can share with. There are no long ranges in the, kingdoms of, in the kingdom of God. Society says if you're strong, you don't need anybody else. That's what society says. But this book tells me that, that two, three people gathering together, God shows up in the midst. It tells me that a three-string three cord is hard to break. Always have somebody, your spouse, a friend, someone you can talk to. Every week I talk to certain people, almost the same people every week. I'll get a call from them or I'm going to call them. And we always check each other. How you doing, man? What's going on in your life? Don't you lie to me. Amen. I know you too well. Hallelujah. My pastor and I talk every Sunday morning. Amen. There's that accountability, that, that understanding that well, let's share you know, with each other. If I get caught in the rain, if I'm out there in the rain, forgive me. I want you wet with me. I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be by myself. <laughs> I like having folk being wet with me. I can't tell you how many times I've been riding in a hard storm on a scooter, and I look over at one of my friends, and rain's just flowing off of us, and I just throw my thumb up and laugh at them. Amen, because we wet, and I mean wet, wet. You ain't get. I mean wet, wet. So I, it, it's going to happen. If you, if you enjoy it enough, it's going to happen. Proverbs 18.1 says, A man separates himself and defiles all sound judgment. You need to have people in your life. James 5.16, confess your faults to one another. Pray for each other. This thing has been so misquoted. So, some people think it means quote your sin, uh, confess your sins. I don't confess your sins to people. Confess your sins to God. Confess your faults to others. Amen. Uh, you know, as I move through life, I find myself stumbling and bumbling just a little bit more. I confess it to people. I, I'll, I'll be in a place standing, and I'll say, excuse me. Now, this may look like a fault to you, but I need to lean against something so I just don't tip over right here. Confess your faults one to another. Amen. What you're struggling with. You, 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 sometimes we, we do lose faith. And we need to confess it to somebody. You need to pray for me. I'm slipping right here right now in my faith. God, give me strength to move through this. Amen. Let's keep preaching here, preacher. Keep focused and committed to God's word and your destiny. Don't let the rain rob your future. Rain forces you to focus. This morning on the way here, I had to drive below the speed limit. It's one of the first times in my life I remember doing that. But it forced me to focus. Amen. I was paying attention to it. I was, uh, Sister Lori and I flew into Nashville years ago and rented a little Mustang. <clears throat> Driving down to Alabama to see my mom and dad. My pop was still alive then. And the windshield wipers quit working. And instead of pulling over and stopping with the windshield wipers not working in the rain, I asked Lori, if she wouldn't mind rolling her window down and sticking her hand and grab hold of the windshield wiper and every now and then just give it a good yank like that. And being a compliant wife as she is, she stuck her hand out the window, rain, water all over. It's a rental car. I didn't care how wet it got. It's a, it whooped that thing a couple of times to keep it going. It forced us to focus. Amen. Sometimes you got to have somebody like that to help pull the windshield wipers for you. Can I get an amen? All you wives say you do it. Amen. Isaiah 26.3 says, 
You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. My man, Josiah, if you'd come on up. He trusts in you. Listen to this verse again. You will keep him in perfect peace. Him whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. Not up, not down, steadfast. That I stay steady in God. Amen. If I keep that way, I'm going to have peace. Staying steady in him. Amen. Listen, my friend, sometimes we like to have pity parties to see who had the worst week or got the, the most problems. You have to get your thoughts in order. Steadfast. The apostle Paul was a steadfast man. Amen. He felt in his spirit that God told him to go to Rome. As a man, he had a steadfastness to him. He got into a boat, and the boat shipwrecked. You would say to yourself, in that turbulence, 276 men were saved. In the book of Acts 27 and 28, a man would landed on an island called Malta. You would think to yourself, sir, I don't think you ought to go to Rome. Looks like you had a storm to stop you. There on that island, he began to gather wood and made a fire. And out of the fire, a viper came and fastened on his hands. All the foreign people of that island said, God must be against him because the snake has bit him. It's a foreign and an old theology, if you would, that teaches us that if something bad happens, evidently God is not favoring you. Let me tell you, that couldn't be further from the truth. The storm hit steadfast. He actually told the men on the boat, if you'll stick with me, if you'll stick with me, none of you will die. And all the men, after that shipwreck, made it to shore on boards and floating material from that boat. With the fire going, the snake fastened on his hand. The people looked at him from the island and said, he, he must not be of God. Then the scripture says he shook the viper. By the way, that had to be poisonous because the people knew it back into the fire and he felt no harm the leader of the island came to him and said my father-in-law is dying of a fever would you come pray for him now Paul the apostle had just went through a storm shipwreck snake bit now he's asked to go pray for a man can I ask you a question who do you want to come pray for you Somebody whose life's up and down, up and down, up and down? Or do you call somebody who's been through the storm? They were teachable. They were mature. They handled it without whining. They pressed on through it. They'd been bit by the snake. They shook it off into the fire. They didn't puff up. They didn't die. They didn't get bitter. They let it go. He went to the island man, prayed over him. And God gave him a miracle, and the fever left him. Then Paul went on to Rome, where he was later beheaded after speaking to the heads of state. Steadfast. Steadfast. That's what God wants us to be. Amen? We all got to start closing here. Nothing happens as fast as you want it to. It don't. I'm going to get a house and pay it off. <laughs> Help yourself. Amen. I'm going to get a job, save a lot of money. Help yourself. I'm going to get this child raised in no time. Yeah, right. It's still going to take 30 years. Amen. Nothing takes his faith. Hebrews 6, 12. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what had been promised. Don't buckle under your problems. Amen. The rain allows us to see ourselves. It's when you're going through the storm, you see who you are. Peter was a man that walked on the water. The other disciples were men who stayed in the boat. It forces you to see who you are. When you go, are you going to panic, give up? I, I tell you, through the storms we've endured as a church, as a body of believers, many would have gave up and quit. But we pressed on and persevered. Amen. We learned things through it. It took longer than we expected. But we rebuilt. We rebuilt back better. Our lives are, my home is better. There are times, church, I will sit in my house. And I live in an old home. But there in that house, I look around and realize that the wiring in this house was faulty. The plumbing in this house was faulty. The AC in this house was faulty. And after two floods, that house is nice. 
I said, I thank God for the flood. Amen. And the stuff we went through. Amen. It gave me a better home to come home to. Amen. Put you in a better home. Amen. Stuck you out in the woods. <laughs> but the Lord blessed you. Amen. The disciples were fearful and faithless. Amen. Next thing happens, the rain can be times of restoration. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in the time of turbulence, trouble, buffeting, agitation. Mike, I know you fly airplanes. Last time I was in a plane that got buffeted, hit agitation, went up and down. And them things that hold the luggage started popping open, falling out. I was screaming in the plane. Come on, Jesus. I was smiling. People thought I lost my mind. But I thought if I'm going down, I'm going down shouting. Amen. It ain't up to me whether this plane stays up or not. I'm, Come on, Jesus. Amen. I'm shouting on this plane. And I remind myself that if I'm in a plane or wherever else, I'm going to give God praise on my way down. Hallelujah. Amen. Acts 319, therefore repent, return to him. What, what does that do? Well, when you get buffeted, when you get beat up, it, it brings you into a place of repentance. You want to make sure you're right with God. Lord, make sure I'm right here. Amen. I don't want to leave this place without you. He says, repent, turn to him, have your sins blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and so that he may send you Jesus, the Christ whom he appointed long ago. When you got Jesus, you got refreshing. When you repented, you got Jesus. Jesus brings refreshing. After the rain is the refreshing. Woo! Thank you, Lord. They're not like seeing a scene of the Old West when people walk out of the buildings and look up toward the heavens during the rain and let it just flow over them. When I was a little boy, we didn't have an indoor uh, bathrooms. So we had an outside tub that the water would go off the house and fill up. And we would have to take baths and that after the, the sun would heat up the water just a little. But every now and then, a good rain would come without lightning. And my mom would hand us a bar of Dial soap. And we would run out in the rain in our shorty shorts. And we would get refreshed and bathe in the rain. There's nothing like the freshness after you repent, amen, after you refresh, and then you restart, amen. Father, I thank you for this house. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you've got a moment here to think just a little bit clearer after hearing this message, you say, Pastor, I need to repent. My faith was waning during turbulence in my life. I struggled during the times of the rain. God, I'm asking you, I, I need to repent today. In fact, you just slip your hand up right now. Amen. Repentance don't mean you ain't saved. It means, God, forgive me for doubting you during the times of the storm. Amen. Those hands lifted, praying with me. Lord Jesus, you're with me in the storms. You're with me in the turbulence. You're with me in the wind. You're with me in the rain. You're with me afterward. God, forgive me for doubting you. Today, I repent. Refresh me. I'm restarting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. <laughs> Amen. Don't, don't, don't let the rain rob your destiny. Don't let it take away your future. Amen. It's going to try, but you ain't going to let it. If our servant leaders would come up and join me here. If you need to tie the offering envelope, it's in front of you. And prayerfully, you've already made your tithe out. That even this week, this week, you've received your uh, some paperwork from us, letting us know what you gave last year. You can use it for your taxes or to remind you where you're at. I went out to eat with a friend this week. He invited me. We just got this accountability thing where we talk with one another. And he looked at me and he said, he said, Pastor, y'all, I thought y'all made a mistake. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I got my giving statement in. And then I grabbed my W-2, and I, I figured it up. And I thought, y'all didn't, y'all didn't, y'all didn't collect all the things I gave. And he said, after I started looking at it, I realized I was wrong. I didn't give as much as I should have gave last year. 
So I'm a little behind. And I looked at him and I confessed, sir, I'm the same way. I looked at my tithe statement and I looked at my W-2 and I was a little short. So I wrote a check out this week to catch up. Amen. Because I never want to be in the rears when it comes to honoring God with my tithing and my offering. Amen. And when he said that to me, I appreciated that kind of frankness and honesty because I don't go to you. I don't press you. I'm not a Mormon. You don't know. In the Mormon church, they will go to their members if they are short on their tithe. You say, is that important? To them, it's very important. If you know anything about the Mormon culture and the 250-year-old religion, it's through their tithing that they built all that they built in Salt Lake. Brigham Young University. The universities all around the world now came from faithful members who tithe. I would never make you tithe. I will never go after you for your tithing. I believe it should be an honor system between you and God. But on the flip side, when I, because I, you know, I hang out. I, I got a lot of Mormon friends now that we have them out at the ranch. Pastor, why y'all let Mormons come out to the ranch? Because they pay their bills. Because they tithe. And they're learning how to honor God. Amen. So our, our camps are full. Sister Tony been taking it down. We, we, we full up June and July with camps. Most of them are LDS camps. They're fun to talk to. They're a mess. That religion is a little bit of a mess. Don't go there if you like coffee. I'm just saying. Amen. David, you wouldn't make it. You'd have to backslide, wouldn't you? Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for it. More money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, and success to the kingdom. Pastor David.